Renee, you let me know when we're ready to go, when we're going to start. All right, Samantha, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Um, I, I don't see the button. I don't have that capability. Did it work that time? No, it worked. <laughs> We're practicing it. I was still sharing my screen. So I apologize. No problem. All right, it is 12.02. I want to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us to the Rebel Recharge, the January 15th Rebel Recharge. Stacy, I will pass it to you. Thank you, Renee. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us for our first virtual Rebel Recharge Lecture of 2021. We're excited, excited to conclude our first ever Wellness Week programming with this timely and informative lecture on nutrition as we ring in the new year. We're thrilled many of you have chosen to be with us today, and we continue to inform and engage our alumni community virtually. My name is Stacy Purcell, and I'm the president of the UNLV Alumni Association. It is my honor to personally welcome each of you here today. I would also like to give special recognition to Blake Douglas, our interim associate vice president for alumni engagement and interim executive director of the Alumni Association. A special thank you as always to Renee Rivera Gelfi, our coordinator for programs and events and for producing today's virtual lecture. Our next virtual Rebel Recharge is scheduled for Friday, February 19th. As we celebrate Black History Month, the topic will be give and take, relationship building between Black alumni and historically white institutions, presented by Dr. Kevin Wright, Assistant Director for Social Diversity in the Division of Student Affairs at UNLV. We have a robust schedule of events this spring, and I encourage you to visit our website, engage UNLV slash events for more information on all of the upcoming events. I also encourage you to share your excitement about our events by inviting others to join and posting on social media channels tagging at UNLV alumni. Our goal is to continue to grow programs and events and create fun, educational, and engaging opportunities for our alumni, faculty, staff, students, and community members. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's program, Samantha Coogan. Samantha joined the Kinesiology and Nutrition Sciences Department during fall of 2016 and serves as the, as the Director of Didactic Program in Nutrition and Dietetics, DPND, and Community Preceptor for the Dietetic Internship Program. She also teaches Intro to Human Nutrition, Food, Science, Life Cycle Nutrition, Community Nutrition, MNT, and Food and Ethic Issues, Ethnic Issues within the undergraduate program. Samantha earned her Bachelor's in Nutrition Sciences and Master's in Exercise Physiology from UNLV. She's a Fellow of the Academy of Nutrition Diet and Dietetics, past President of the Nevada Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and a member of the Sports Cardiovascular Wellness Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group, also the Nutrition and Dietetic Educators and Preceptors Practice Group, and at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. We're thrilled to have Samantha with us today to share her research and perspective 
on navigating nutrition in a world of fake news and bad advice. Please join me in welcoming Samantha Coogan. Well, thank you so much, Stacey, for that wonderful introduction and to the Alumni Association for having me today. And thank you to all of you for joining me. I know that you're all very busy as we're getting ready to start this semester. So I appreciate you taking some time out today to learn a little bit more and kudos to you for doing something for yourself to improve your own health and wellness. So, you know, self-care is becoming more and more important than ever now with this pandemic lockdown. So thank you for being here. Um, so today I hope that you will really discover some differences in the way that you might have approached this topic when you first signed up for this particular lecture. So I'm hoping to kind of change your minds a little bit today. So by the end of this presentation, I'm hoping that you'll be able to decipher the differences between a portion size and a serving size, how to properly read a food label, how to incorporate an intuitive eating model into your lifestyle. And this is a majority of what we're gonna be covering today. The differences between some of the more popular fad diets and whether they do or do not learning new techniques to enhance your nutrient quality of cooked foods, and then just feeling empowered and confident with the information that you learn here today. And just uh, the way this will be structured. So we have three different sections that we're gonna be covering today, and I'm going to pause for questions at the end of each section. So when the next black screen comes up, I will pause for questions for any of you to ask of me. So getting started, portion distortion. So if you're not familiar with this term, it is basically over time, larger and larger portion sizes that most people in general deem to be a normal size, serving size. So if we see here, we're comparing from 20 years ago. So remember 20 years ago is 2001. Does anybody else ever go back to like the nineties where you see 20 years? So think about say, um, a Wendy's Junior Bacon Cheeseburger, that size hamburger was the norm 20 years ago. We pop over here, think more like Cheesecake Factory, Claim Jumper sizes, where your food is brought out to you on more of a platter than a And what has happened over time is we have been fed so many different theories, you know, finish your plate. And we have kind of fallen into this trap where we have to consistently adhere to these kind of archaic types of principles. Now, if you use that theory, finish your plate at Claim Jumper, you're really gonna be finishing your platter <laughs> at that point. So you just have to really be more mindful of what you're eating and just understand that there is a difference between the portion size that you consume and the recommended serving size, which is what we will get to next. So portion distortion was created as an initiative through the uh, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute and Obesity Education Initiative because of the trends over time in increase in portion sizes that was then trending to an increased risk for obesity across the country. So the main difference here between a serving size and a portion size. A serving size is the suggested amount to consume based on the food label, and it's listed on the food label that we can see here in point number one. It's usually always accompanied by the servings per container, which we can see in point two. Now, a portion size is the actual portion that you consume, whether that falls within the serving size or not. So consuming the entire contents of this food package, for example, would mean that you would need to multiply all of these values by the servings per container. Now, I will tell you, I have been, I've done this myself. I've taken down an entire bag of hot Cheetos before. No shame, no judgment there. So what did I have to do? I had to take every value and multiply it by however many servings were in that container. Now, that was my portion size. That was not the suggested serving size. At that point, I ate eight times this suggested serving size. So just to backtrack, there's not necessarily anything wrong with eating more than the suggested size, but just being cognizant to the fact that what the label says is not necessarily true, and you have to do a little bit of math to truly understand what you actually did consume. Now, I'm not a big fan of calorie tracking and things like that because it just is usually never productive. It tends to create a lot of obsessiveness with the numbers, but just so you know in the general sense of how a serving size works versus a portion size. Now, if you had two servings of this particular food product, you would have two of the suggested serving sizes, but you had, that was your total portion 
if that makes sense. So it's physically consuming and that single sitting is your portion and it may be less than the serving size, more than the serving size or somewhere in between. Now, just with the basic of a food label, I'm sure that many of you have noticed over the years that the food label has been updated a little bit and they've made it a little bit easier for the consumer to read. And the main thing they did was really make calories nice and big because most consumers really only care about the calories when they're looking at the food label initially. So as a professional, it's my least favorite thing to look at, but most average consumers are going to be looking only at calories. So they made this a little larger. And then within each of these categories here, any bold heading is your main category. And then anything that is unbolded is a subcategory that comprises the total category. So for total fat, for example, saturated fat and trans fat are both components that make up the total eight grams of fat in this food. Cholesterol is its own category. Sodium is its own category. Carbohydrates, usually this is the one where you'll see the most subcategories underneath. And it depends on what other ingredients are also in the food. So for the most part, you're only going to see fiber and sugars. So sugar is a carbohydrate. Fiber is a carbohydrate. Any added sugars will be listed underneath. And if the product also contains sugar alcohols, that will also be included under total carbohydrates as well. So all of these values here are all contributing to the overall carbohydrate count of this food product. And then protein is its own category. Now at the bottom here, they have also changed these to be more relevant micronutrient uh, levels are just more relevant for health. So vitamin D, we do see that there is a large decrease in vitamin D status across the country for adults. So they have added that to the label to really emphasize the importance of that particular micronutrient. And these values here are all based on what we call the DRI values and those are the dietary reference intake values. So those are optimal levels of intake that each healthy individual should be striving to consume every day in order to maintain health and maintain our metabolism. Now, what this is basically showing you, and it's based on the DRI percentages. So for example, the DRI for calcium in a day is about 1,000 milligrams. This label is telling you is that if you ate this suggested serving size of this food, you would have ingested 260 milligrams of calcium of the 1,000 milligrams that are recommended for the day. So that's how you read and decipher these uh, values down here. And it's only going to be these four. You'll see the same four micronutrients on any food label you are looking at. Okay, so this is really the, the big meat of this presentation and the part I am really excited to discuss with all of you today. So just we started with some basics, how to read a food label, but this is really the empowerment piece of what we're going to be discussing today. So before we get into the principles, because we're going to discuss, discuss each one in depth, I just want to start with a quick little snapshot as to what intuitive eating is. Now, I hope that you've heard of this term. It's becoming more and more popular and much more prevalent in the dietetics world, but it was um, a, a principle that was developed by Evelyn Triboli and Elise Raish back in 1995, and it's a self-care eating framework which integrates instinct, emotion, and rational thought and was created by two registered dietitians. It's a weight-inclusive evidence-based model with a validated assessment scale and over 100 studies to date. And really essentially at its core, intuitive eating is a personal process of honoring health by listening and responding to those direct messages that your body is trying to send to you. So your body and your brain are constantly trying to communicate with you. We just need to start listening to those cues now. And that's really what the foundation of intuitive eating is. And what intuitive is not. So intuitive eating is not a diet or a food plan. There is no pass or fail. There is nothing to count. There's no calories to count. There's no points to keep track of. There's no macros to count. There's no way for you to blow it. That's the whole principle behind, or whole theory behind these principles is that we are really allowing you and your body to make the decisions. No one else knows your hunger cues like you do. No one else knows your fullness cues like you do. No one knows how you think, how you feel, how you respond to different experiences. So this is really an inner journey and in how food affects you and the way in which you cope with it in different situations and just listening to what your body is telling you. Okay. So let's dive into each of the principles here. So number one, reject the diet mentality. 
So I just want to say, as registered dietitians, we are not the food police. I don't know who tried to make us the food police, but we are not. I can't tell you how many gatherings I've been to, fun social gatherings where we're supposed to be laughing and having fun foods. I'll walk into the room and my colleagues will cover their plate. Oh, don't look at what I'm eating. If you're not paying me for my opinion, then you eat whatever you want. It is your prerogative. I am not here to, you know, make you feel any which way about it. Also, on the flip side, I can't tell you how many times I've had colleagues come up to me, I'm eating a cookie. Oh, the dietitian's eating a cookie? Yes, because we also love food. Food is fun. And I also love Mountain Dew and all of the other fun things that aren't deemed as healthy because we're all human beings. So there is no authority in a particular principle. You know, get angry with those diet cultures. This really is, if you want to label it at all, it's an anti-diet. You know, it's really getting away from those quick fixes and, you know, too good to be true claims and really just getting to know yourself and your body again. Principle number two, honor your hunger. Don't let yourself get excessively hungry or to that hangry standpoint, because usually more often than not, what happens is when you then give into those cravings, you usually crave really calorically dense types of foods, right? You're not craving carrots and broccoli. So when you do finally come back to eating, then you go on a little bit of a binge, can really kind of undo a lot of what you were attempting to do for the day. That is why it is never good advice if you are trying to lose weight to skip meal or to just stop eating or only eat one meal in the day because not only does it slow down your metabolism, it also just causes to overeat once you actually get that first bite of food into your system again. So it's usually more often than that counterproductive and it's much more sound to actually graze throughout the day. Now grazing can be a good thing if you do it thoughtfully and mindfully and you graze on things like nuts and seeds or um, you know, cheese and crackers or something like that. You know, don't graze on pop tarts and you know, candy and, and things of that nature. But if you eat consistently throughout the day, every two to three hours, your body and your metabolism is constantly trying to burn those calories. So at a natural point, you're just going to start to burn more calories than you were before because your body is just trying to get rid of all of it. So our bodies do these wonderful compensatory things to help us and assist us in our day-to-day -day functions. And more often than not, what we do is we just keep trying to combat our bodies when they're trying to give us cues for a reason. Number three, make peace with food. Stop just call a truce with the food. Leave out, I can't have this, I shouldn't have that, because really get back and maintain that healthy relationship with food. Food should be fun. There shouldn't be negative connotations connected to food because that can lead to more detrimental things like eating disorders and disordered eating. So, you know, maintaining balance and positivity around food and don't make anything off limits for yourself. You know, even for myself as a dietitian, my father, he has type 2 diabetes. When he was first diagnosed, he was in the mindset, I can never have cake again. I can never have a cookie again. No, no, dad, I made sure I corrected all that. Nothing is off limits. Now it's just things in moderation. So you can still enjoy any food that is your favorite type of food. Just do it more responsibly if you have to, because if you cut it out completely, you're gonna miss it far too much. And then again, when that craving hits, you're going to go a little overboard. Principle number four, challenge the food police. So not the dietitians, the food police, the fake food police that are out there. Again, just getting rid of, there's no more of that good versus bad, you know, eat this, not that type of a mentality. We're really trying to get away from that type of thinking. And, you know, um, the food police tend to, and I say food police, tend to monitor everything that you do. And if they're physically around you or, they put little sound bites into your head like, oh, did you have another one of those today? So just getting rid of those negative thoughts and feelings and um, something that I like to call cup drain. You know, anyone who is kind of trying to take away from the positive things that you're trying to do in your life. So that's really where, you know, challenging the food police and just gaining more confidence in yourself that if someone tells you something, it may not necessarily be true just because they've been told that for 20 years of their life over and over again necessarily the way that the world works. Okay, so just have, create your own identity when it comes to you and your food choices. Number five, discover the satisfaction factor. 
So when you eat what you actually want, you create this beautiful experience for yourself. And that's what food should be, right? It should be an experience that you are actually experiencing at that time. I don't mean to use the same word to describe that situation, but when you sit down to each meal, it should be something that you are actually enjoying and that you are satisfied with when you are done. You know, um, eating is very social. We use it to celebrate, we use it to grieve. You know, so you have to create and maintain that healthy relationship with food because if you're packing yourself a lunch and it's not something that you enjoy, why did you pack yourself that lunch? I see it so often. You know, colleagues of mine, they'll be sitting in the break room and they're barely touching their food. And, you know, I'll ask like, oh, like, just joking around, oh, lunch isn't good today. Well, I don't, I didn't really want this. So then I get into a deeper conversation with them. Well, you know, at home, do you normally eat Athena yogurt? No. Okay, why did you pack it in your lunch then? Well, because, you know, I'm used to packing my lunch this way because when I was younger, I would pack it this way or my spouse packed it for me or my mom told me this or whatever. Whatever we've been taught as children, we tend to carry on as, as adults. So why, if we're at work, are we making that meal unenjoyable for ourselves? Every meal should be something that we enjoy, right? Work can be stressful as it is, so why not take that hour to have something that you actually enjoy? Don't just force yourself to do something because you think that you're supposed to be doing it. And then I'll follow up even further. If you were at home having lunch, would you have chosen that for lunch at home? No. Then why are you packing it and bringing it with you? Get yourself something that you will actually enjoy and who cares about what anybody else thinks about the food? Nobody else has a right to tell you how to feel or think about your food choices other than you. So please take that from me as a registered dietitian. If you want to deem me as a nutrition authority for this particular moment, I hereby grant you permission to listen to your bodies, listen to your hunger cues, and enjoy the foods and the feelings and experiences as they come to you. Don't fight them. For some reason, we always have to fight and we try to fight those good feelings and stop doing that. <laughs> All right. Principle number six, feel your fullness. So learning to get yourself to the point of feeling comfortably full. Now, I have also been very guilty of this, of getting myself to be very uncomfortably full. There is a difference. So there is a difference between mindfulness while you're eating and just emotional eating. So really taking the time to savor the food, slowing down a little bit because your body does take some time to catch up to the brain. It's gonna take you a little bit of time before your body realizes like, oh, we are full. So when you do eat too quickly, you could overeat because your body isn't cueing you quickly enough. It usually takes about 20 minutes for your body to finally signal to your brain, hey, it's time to stop eating now. Okay. So just approach food with a more mindful onset. Savor the flavor, the mouthfeel, the texture, the aroma. That's why all of these components of food make foods enjoyable or unenjoyable because of the different components. So why not take this time then to actually savor every moment of your meal or your snack, whatever it might be. Number seven, cope with your emotions with kindness. Okay. So food restriction is usually counterintuitive again because it can, can trigger a loss of control. And oftentimes when few people feel like they are not in control of their food or their choices, it's often the starting point for disordered eating. So we wanna prevent that as much as possible. So again, don't restrict yourself and don't allow for things to be off limits. Obviously, if you have a food allergy, that would probably be the only exception of foods that would be off limit. But for the most part, don't get into your head with those negative thoughts and tell yourself, I can't have this, I shouldn't have that. Because once you hit that trigger point, it could be completely counterproductive. So allow yourself to cope with things as they come to you and maybe recognize you might have to start journaling maybe recognize how often you do maybe eat when you are emotional whether happy or sad these are good things to just keep track of but not to obsess over just so that you can self-reflect not necessarily to correct anything if it's not a problem but it is good for you to kind of be more mindful and aware as to how certain foods do affect you and how you create a relationship and a coping mechanism related to food. Number eight, respect your body. So accept your genetic blueprint. We can't pick our parents, right? We, some of us maybe wish that we could, but 
our genetics are our genetics. And think about uh, Cinderella and her evil stepsisters. I'm going to use a shoe size example here. Okay? If you wear a size 8, there is no physical way for you to ever fit into a size 6 shoe. So why would you ever have the expectation that you could fit into someone else's type of body type? Okay? So you are you. You should always only, I always joke around, like, worry about yourself. You know, compare yourself to yourself. Don't compare yourself to others and other people's body types. Of course, you can have aspirations and inspirations, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that you are you and you are unique for a reason. And that's a great thing. Okay. So don't be overly critical of yourself. Be kind to yourself. This is a big lesson that I had to learn for myself a few years ago. And a friend of mine thankfully taught it to me. And it's something that I now try to implement with my patients and clients and my students also. So for a long time, I had a lot of negative self-talk for myself. You know, I, I felt like I wasn't good enough or, you know, I almost had an imposter syndrome. So think about the way that you speak to yourself. And let's use an example if you were going up for a promotion. Okay? And you're thinking you're getting ready to complete your promotion packet and you're thinking, I don't deserve this. I don't know why they think that I'm eligible for this. I'm too dumb for this. Once I'm not going to be able to fulfill these duties once I get this position, I don't know why I'm doing this. Why am I here? Take that script now and change the verbiage a little bit. Would you ever accept a friend of yours being spoken to that way? Would you ever accept the words, you are too dumb for this. You will not be able to succeed. You are not eligible for this. No, you would probably step in to defend your friend or your colleague at that point, right? So now when you are talking to yourself, you need to flip that script again. And you need to, because you would jump in to defend, no, he or she is good enough. They will do a great job when they're in this position. They do deserve to be here. So bring that back to yourself. I do deserve to be here. I will do a great job when I get this promotion. I am eligible for this. You need to start to treat yourself the way that you expect others to be treated. And more often than not, we are usually harshest to ourselves and the least kind to ourselves. And we need to take care care of ourselves first and foremost, if we are going to be capable of taking care of anyone else in our lives. And that starts with the way in which we see ourselves and the way that we speak to ourselves. So I hope that you feel a little bit more empowered to oh, you know, say, okay, I'm great at this. I'm wonderful at that. Like start using positive identifiers for yourself. It's not cocky, it's confidence. Okay. Um, principle number nine, movement, feel the difference. So it doesn't have to be some strict militant type of exercise regimen. However, if you do enjoy exercise and you do like structure, that is also okay. This principle is really just saying, just do something to get yourself up and moving. If you like to dance, dance. If you, know, if you want to dance when no one's watching, if you're home by yourself and that makes it more enjoyable for you, then do that. If you like to go for walks, if you like to swim, triathlons, if you like to lift weights, whatever it is that brings you enjoyment, that gets you moving to some degree, however big or small it might be, that is fantastic and what we want you to do. And really with this, choosing movements too that you're confident in doing. You know, don't force yourself into doing a movement that you're not good at or that you've never done before. Do things that will empower you to continue doing them. You know, just like food should be fun, movement should also be fun. It should be something that you look forward to and that you don't constantly dread. And by doing that, it should hopefully give you more confidence going forward because, you know, when we get into these situations where we have a lot of negative self-talk, you know, self-loathing, it, it's just not an attractive quality and it's not productive because you are so much more powerful and capable than you even realize. And usually everyone else around you can see it, right? You just need to convince yourself that you are just as great as everyone else sees. And our last principle, number 10, honor your health with gentle nutrition. So, you don't have to eat perfectly to be healthy, okay? Make the food choices that honor your health and your taste buds and the foods that make you feel good and give you good experiences. What you eat consistently over time, you know, it, it does matter. And choosing things that are relevant and they serve a purpose for you because this is about progress, not perfection. So are the foods that you're choosing, do they serve a purpose? They could serve a health purpose, they could serve a satisfaction purpose, they could serve an appetite purpose. Whatever that is for you, it, it only matters to you how important that is. So <clears throat> the body has you know, a normal reset and a state of homeostasis as it is. 
So, you know, if you have one bad meal, it's not going to undo everything you did. Just like one perfectly healthy meal isn't going to all of a sudden reset you. Now, you've probably noticed over time that you your weight has probably fluctuated for the most part within a five pound range over the last couple of years. You've probably stayed at about the same weight for that many years because your body is just has this natural reset. But it's not about weight. If, if you truly are concerned about your health and your wellness, I hate the scale. It's, it's one of my least favorite things because it does not take into account body composition. And body composition is what's really the most important factor to look at for wellness. Much like the BMI scale, the scale is only looking at what you physically weigh, including your skeleton, your body fat mass, and your lean muscle mass. Body composition, what that does is it, sh it breaks up and it shifts your body's components to really give you a better indication as to how your body is distributed. It looks at your lean muscle mass versus your fat mass and things of that nature. So, you know, stay off that scale. If you have to step on that scale, just to track, maybe reduce it down to like once a week, just to see if you're maintaining at a certain level, but try not to get bogged down in what that scale number says, because if you are on a weight loss journey, for example, and if you're exercising and incorporating nutrition, what's going to happen is on the scale, your weight either might stay the same or it might actually go up because what's happening is as your body fat percentage is starting to decrease your lean muscle mass is starting to increase and muscle is more dense than fat so you're going to look on the scale as if you weigh more with less body fat and more lean muscle mass and it's often very discouraging for people but that's actually exactly what we want the body to do we want the body to redistribute so that's why the scale number is not necessarily a good indicator. We can look at a bodybuilder, a yoked out bodybuilder on a BMI scale. He tests as clinically obese when we know that he's not. His body fat percentage is in the single digits. So really just taking that into account as well. The scale is not the end all be all of anything. Okay, so now I would like to pause for questions if anyone does have them for me for this section. There is one question in the Q&A. Can you see that or did you want me to read it? Could you read it? Yeah, I, do, I can't see it. Sure. This question is from Isaac. What strategies do you suggest instead of calorie tracking? Um, so if anything, instead of calories, what's more critical is actually looking at your macronutrients. So if you did want to track something, looking at getting adequate protein and carbohydrates, and then allowing the fat to fall where it lies. Tracking protein and carbohydrates, is just gonna be a better indicator for you versus calories, because if you're tracking your macros, then you're typically gonna be tracking greater quality of calories versus an overall calorie count. So, and you could use this with all types of tracking systems like MyFitnessPal. Um, if you just wanted to track like your protein, your carbohydrates, and your fat, it's gonna give you that caloric, um, total, but don't track the calories. Just keep track of each individual macronutrient every day. And I think that will give you a better indication. And it will also probably help you figure out like if you're exercising, for example, and you feel like you're not recovering quite as well, look at your protein and how is your protein tracking throughout the week. And maybe you have to bump up that number um, to improve your recovery. And then you can test that out. So that would be my preferred method is macros over the calories if that was helpful to, to him. Are there any other questions? I do not see any other questions, but I will confess I do have a problem with the scale every morning and I do work out often, so I have to stay away from that. So thank you for pushing yeah. me to stay away from the scale. Yes, yeah, it's important. And I've been there too, where I just have gotten obsessed over it and you know, every day tracking it, so absolutely. Before I go on to this next section, I'm just gonna unshare my screen for a second because I want to show you all a book that um, I think would be really beneficial to all, any of you if you were interested in reading and it just pairs with intuitive eating. Um, this was written by a registered dietitian. I have no stakes in this book. It's just a book that I really enjoyed reading and it really describes some of these principles really well. It's called Body Kindness by uh, Rebecca Scritchfield. It retails for like $15, but it just um, implements some of the principles that we talked about in a really nice, easy to read format. And it, she has some tracking tools in here too, um, but just really positive messages and just a really good thing. I actually keep this on my desk just as a constant reminder, like just, you know, be 
kind to yourself. You know, body kindness is really important and it does start here because oftentimes if we can be kind to ourselves in this regard, it usually transfers into better mental health as well. So for anyone interested in that, you know, this is a good read and resource for you. Share my screen again. Okay. So now we will move on to bad diets and why some may or may not work. Okay, so I really just chose kind of the most popular ones. Now, a few of these I have actually tried myself because as a dietitian, if I'm working with patients and clients, I do need to kind of know what it feels like to go through these when my patients and clients do ask me about them. The only one I haven't personally done myself is um, Weight Watchers International. So the keto diet, this is probably the most prevalent out there that everyone's talking about is the keto diet. So the keto diet is a high fat, low carbohydrate diet with sufficient protein that was originally developed as a therapeutic diet to treat children with epilepsy. So it was not a diet meant for any type of weight loss, weight maintenance. It was purely therapeutic for children who were suffering from severe epileptic fits very, very often. And they found because fat is such a huge component for brain development in growing children that incorporating a higher fat diet was better to combat these recurring episodic um, epileptic episodes. And by going so high fat and low carbohydrate, it forces the body into ketosis by burning the fat rather than those carbohydrates. And you can typically identify if you're in a state of ketosis because one of the side effects is having fruity smelling breath. So if anyone is close to you and they mention that, you know, your breath might smell like a little pineapple-y, apple-y, something like that, that's usually an indicator that you might be in a state of ketosis. Now, that may, may not be true for every single person, but that's one of the most common symptoms. The carnivore diet. So this one is made up entirely of meat and animal products and excludes all other foods. Okay. The paleo diet is a diet that was really popular. It was made very popular by um, those in the CrossFit community. And this diet um, incorporates foods that could be found in the past by hunters and gatherers. So lean meats, fish, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. It limits foods that became common when farming emerged around 10,000 years ago. So it restricts things like dairy products, grains, and legumes. Now on the next slide, I'm gonna give a little bit more of my opinion on these. I'm really just kind of going through the basics of these right now. Um, WW International was formerly called Weight Watchers and it still is Weight Watchers, but they've tried to get rid of saying the words weight and watchers all the time. So when they're rebranding, they're just WW now. So it's a weight loss program using smart points and um, it tracks things like calories, sugar, saturated fat, and protein. People following the weight loss plan can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. That is a promise made on their website. And they do actually have a new holistic approach with digital tracking features that's called Weight Watchers Reimagined. And it actually is, in my opinion, it's better than it was in the past because it does incorporate more of this holistic approach to it. And it doesn't emphasize so much the point system. So in the past, it was just all about points. You know, if you were allotted 25 points in the day, as long as you stayed within those points, it didn't matter where your calories came from. So it wasn't a great model in the past because it wasn't really educating those who would use this particular diet once they stopped, you know, the program. So if they wanted to go off on their own, they hadn't really learned enough you know, like what equal to point or what those caloric conversions meant in the grand scheme of things. So there was a lot of success in the past. So they've revamped the program and it, it seems like it's a much better program than it was prior to. All right, so do they work? So it kind of depends on the person and how you do it. And the reason I wanted to start with intuitive eating is because even if you were following any of these, you can still follow those intuitive eating principles within these particular diets too. So for example, when I tried keto and carnivore and paleo at each time, I stuck to it, but then there was a day, like when I was on carn carnivore, I was like, I want pizza today. So I broke the rules, it doesn't matter. So if you still wanna try some of these things, you don't have to fit into every mold of the diet. Okay? So keto. It could possibly work if you do it the right way, but the problem is so many people don't do it the right way. That's why most people say it doesn't work. 
So there's possible improvements to blood sugar and for those um, who are trying to manage their diabetes. It's tough to maintain long term though, especially for anyone who does love carbohydrates. It's very hard to restrict your carbohydrates that much. Now, the thing here is we're not going completely carb free either. So that's never healthy for the body at a minimum. Just to get our brains up and awake and functioning every single day, we need at least 130 grams of carbohydrates per day. So we would never never recommend, you know, zero carbohydrates of anything. Okay. Um, it's unclear if there are long term side effects and typically it's most useful for competition prep. So you'll see this a lot in the bodybuilding community. A lot of bodybuilders will use this just to kind of reduce their body fat as they kind of gear up for competition and. Those who aren't. Uh, familiar with how it works, a lot of people see this as a counterintuitive diet because, oh, if I'm having so much fat, isn't, isn't it going to make me fat? No, because fat has a higher satiety value compared to carbohydrates, you do typically tend to eat less fat throughout the day because if you're increasing the total fat intake, you're just going to naturally eat less of it because your body's just going to feel fuller for longer throughout the day. Okay. Now, it could be safe if followed with doctor's guidance. Now, there are more and more doctors out there who are specializing in this particular diet and working with their patients and following this much more closely. So there is potential benefit, but only if you do it properly. And that's really just the problem is it's so often just done improperly. Okay? And a lot of consumers get really um, taken advantage of with a lot of the new products that are out there, like keto-friendly cereals, keto friendly this keto friendly that so for marketing you know they're really doing well because they're kind of grabbing everyone because people are just seeing the word keto and they're just thinking it's you know the cure-all for what they need to do when in all actuality it may not be what's going to be most beneficial for them now the carnivore diet um this one claims that it aids in weight loss mood issues and blood sugar regulation and it's extremely restrictive, so it may not be healthy in the long term because you are just reducing and restricting so many other types of foods that you might be missing out on some of the other micronutrients um, because of the fact that you can only you're only supposed to consume animal products on this. Now, with any of these, if you tried these, you also need to monitor and keep track of how these make you feel. And I was doing that. I, I was trying to make sure that I understood like how the carnivore diet was affecting me. How was my mood when I was trying this one? How was my mood when I was on keto? You know, and if overall in the grand sense, if you don't feel good overall with any of these that you're trying, then just stop doing them. You know, do things that are beneficial to you. Again, going back to what purpose is this serving for you? Are you just doing this diet because someone said that you should be on a diet? Whoever said that shouldn't be in your life to begin with if they're gonna be that harsh about it. Okay, there are much better ways to approach, you know, bringing up health matters and things of that nature. So really just make sure that whatever you're doing when you're choosing this, is it serving a purpose for you? What is your why and why you're doing any of this? Okay. So for paleo, while restrictive in the types of foods, there's no caloric or macronutrient restriction. So for this one with paleo, I'm not a big fan of this one because we see here with our example, you can have endless amounts of bacon. There is no caloric restriction whatsoever. And endless amounts of bacon is going to equate to endless amounts of sodium and nitrates also. And it could combat weight loss because there's no other metabolic parameters, because there is no um, goals for macronutrients, there's no goals for any of your actual intake. It can cause for you to overeat, especially if you get stuck in the mindset like, oh, well, I'm allowed to eat unlimited amounts of nuts, seeds, legumes, animal proteins, anything that you overconsume is going to eventually turn into adipose tissue in excess. So you really still have to just continue to be mindful, even if something like this doesn't give you um, some type of goal range. And then with Weight Watchers, there's greater accountability typically because there's a community aspect uh, related to it. And now with the digital tracking platform, it creates even further accountability. Plus, you know, these individuals, they're paying for this program. So that in and of itself is just natural accountability to kind of stick with it. In the past, it didn't really educate users, as I mentioned before, and the new approaches seem to have much more um, educational components to them to actually teach these users how to 
create their meals and snacks going forward once they graduate out of the program. So it can have success because of the accountability factor and with the improvements that they've made, hopefully in the long term, individuals who are using your principles can start to implement them throughout the rest of their lives. Okay, pause for some questions. There are no questions in the Q&A section. However, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. What about intermittent fasting? That seems to be popular right now during this time. That is a great question. Um, I actually am a fan of intermittent fasting. Again, if you do it in the right way, there's several different ways to do it. And this is something that you would just kind of have to figure out which method works best for you and your body by trial and error. So. The hardest method, in my opinion, is to eat regularly for 5 days a week and then fast for 2 full days. That's really tough and it's honestly something that I wouldn't recommend because metabolically it's just going to shift your metabolism around too much. The methods are either the 16, 8 rule or the 14, 10 rule. And basically what that says is you fast for 16 hours a day and you eat an 8 hour window or in the 14, 10, you fast for 14 and you eat for a 10 hour window. So most people getting started, they'll start with the 1410 and then they'll switch over to the 168. And really what that does is in that eight hour window, you're essentially with this principle, you're kind of free to eat whatever you want in that eight hours because you're reducing it to a certain time throughout the day. And you can choose what time works best for you. So like, for example, when I do it, I'll choose to fast in the morning and then I'll start my first meal at like 2 p.m., for example. And it's not something that you have to do every day. But it's nice sometimes to like say you were at a party or maybe you did a little extra drinking over the weekend or something like that. It's a nice little like way to quickly kind of detox. But if you were interested in doing it every day, there are lots of studies out there that it is safe and effective to perform every day as, as you're making sure that you are actually eating within that window and not restricting yourself on even further in that shorter time period. And then of course, with any exercise and timing your exercise and your, um, pre and post nutrition recovery around your exercise. And you might have to time that around your fast as well. So if you exercise during your fast, I don't suggest that because you're not gonna have enough energy. You won't have enough glycogen storage. You are run the risk of injuring yourself if you're not fed during your workout. So try if you can to get your workout somewhere in that eight hour window when you should be consuming food, if that makes sense. That's good information. And we did have a question just come in from Kevin. What about the so-called cleanse diets? Uh, like the like the juice diets? Is it, I'm assuming what he is asking. I'm assuming so. Yes. Yeah. Um. I'll just tell you myself and most dietitians, we hate those types of diets just because an all liquid diet, um, it's just not going to give you. It's going to make you feel hungry all the time because if you're constantly putting liquid into your system, you're telling your stomach and your uh, diet tract, there's food in here, so your body's going to start to metabolize, but it has no physical food to metabolize. So that's why on those juice cleanses, you often start to feel shaky a lot or like you're overly hungry because your body is constantly burning even just the juice because there are calories and things like that in the juice. So it's usually counterproductive and then most people can't stick with it and then they'll binge once they hit that breaking point where it's just unbearable where they can't eat. So I definitely would not recommend a juice cleanse of that nature. I would just start to either reduce some of the foods that maybe you consistently overeat or just simple, quick, easy things that you can just slowly start to build on over time. You know, if you drink soda, for example, if you drink, say, like one or two cans of Coke a day, start off by reducing, just take out one can a day, do that for a week or two, and then take out the next can. Because anything that you do too quickly or full bore going like cold turkey, you don't usually have a, a greater likelihood of sticking to it long term. If you slowly start to remove things over time, then you have a higher chance of sticking to those new changes in the long term because you haven't just been ripped away different things. You've kind of slowly been removing them. So you almost start to not notice it over time and it just becomes a natural part of your day. If that makes sense. Makes sense. And yes, he did mean uh, <laughs> diets. Okay. And so no other questions in this section. Alrighty. Okay, so we are on to our final section and I'm hoping this one will be kind of fun and, and new information for some of you as well. So different ways that you can just enhance the quality of your foods while you're cooking them. So your equipment does matter. 
So there is a science behind a cast iron skillet and copper pots, because what will happen is the metal elements of those particular products will literally leach off into the food. So if you use a cast iron skillet, you're going to leach off the iron into your food and you can enhance the iron quality of the different foods, especially like steak is probably one of the most popular things to cook in uh, a cast iron skillet like this. Steak has iron. That cast iron skillet is only going to enhance the iron quality of that steak. Same for the copper. Air fryers are, I absolutely love air fryers. It's been like my favorite purchase and piece of kitchen equipment lately because I am just a fan of, you know, crunchy things, melty things. I love cheese, things like that. But the air fryer is great because you can still get that sensation, but you completely get rid of all the extra grease, all the extra oil because it uses a convection, I should say convection, not convection, um, oven instead of, you know, the traditional type of conventional oven. So what's really nice about these and they come in all different shapes and sizes there's all different brands out there but what's also nice it's like a crock pot is you just set it and forget it because it's convection you don't have to flip things like so if you are cooking a steak in there you just leave it in there because the air will cook it because it's spinning around it constantly um so i use this for for many different things and um you can use it for frozen foods you can use it for fresh foods produce meats products you know french fries whatever have you um, and it's also great to reheat leftovers too. <laughs> cooking times and temperatures. So slow cooking will retain more nutrients versus fast flash cooking. So like think of a slow cooker versus the microwave. Okay, only cook with oils with high smoke points. So that's what this graphic is down here. So you really wanna pick oils that can burn at higher temperatures because if you pick an oil that burns at a lower temperature and you allow for it to get to that higher temperature, a possibly carcinogenic smoke called acrolyne could be produced. And we want to reduce that because we want to reduce any potential for carcinogenic properties in any of our foods. So when you are frying, not using the air fryer because you don't need any type of oil or anything for the air fryer. But if you are, say, sauteing on the stovetop, then you should be using things like avocado or grapeseed oil or ghee because they have higher smoke points. You can see they're up in the 400s here, avocado in the 500s. Olive oil is used so often in cooking. However, it should not really be used when heating because it has a lower smoke point compared to the other oils. So there are just better oils out there to cook with. Olive oil is best for like things like dressings or anything that you're gonna be using at room temperature, or like to dip bread in, you know, with some balsamic vinegar, but anything that you're gonna heat, try to go for a higher smoke point type of oil, avocado, uh, grape seed, peanut oil, not the healthiest type of oil compared to like avocado, but it's a much better oil to fry in or saute in versus olive oil. Okay. And then steam, bake, blanch, braise, broil, or boil your foods instead of frying them in oil or choose the air fryer. And then steam or blanch your vegetables instead of boiling them. So boiling your vegetables, in most other cases, boiling is a better cooking me method. But for vegetables in particular, you lose a lot of the chlorophyll and a lot of the phytochemicals that are in those foods, and then you'll lose the nutrients that accompany them as well. And you'll also notice that boiling usually tends to degrade the color quality of your food. So like broccoli starts off as this nice, pretty bright green color, and then you boil it and it turns to more of a drab, kind of an olive green. So blanching or steaming would be better options. Blanching is just a really a quick boil. You do it for like less than two minutes, and then you uh, remove it from the heat immediately. And then usually you, when you blanch, you can also freeze it um, after blanching as well. So if you wanted to just save, you know, for your own food budget and you wanted to buy produce in bulk, you can buy fresh produce, blanch it, and then you can uh, freeze it and store it for yourself for later on. Okay. And in that regard, frozen produce is just as healthy and nutrient dense as fresh produce, just to kind of throw that out there for everyone, because every type of frozen produce has to go through that blanching process in order to preserve all of those nutrients. And every food manufacturer has to follow that particular principle before they send the food out to the stores. Okay, and then lastly, pairing foods and seasonings. So pairing certain foods together can enhance the nutrient absorption while other combinations might inhibit nutrient absorption. So the example I'm going to use here, vitamin C enhances the absorption of iron, while calcium actually inhibits the absorption of iron. So we try to promote avoiding dairy products with any iron-rich types of food. 
So an iron rich type of food, like I mentioned before, would be like something like steak. So avoiding any dairy while consuming a steak. A great pairing would be like this example I have here, a four ounce steak with four ounces of pan seared mandarin oranges in a balsamic glaze reduction cooked in a cast iron skillet. That sounds pretty enticing, right? And looks pretty good. So every component of this, we're enhancing the nutrient quality of this food because we're pairing the vitamin C rich mandarin oranges with the iron rich steak. Then we've cooked that steak in a cast iron skillet. So further enhancing the iron quality of this particular meal. And now if the food doesn't naturally have iron in it, the iron that leaches off will also just contribute to the overall sauce or reduction or whatever it's being cooked in. You're still gonna get those nutrients to leach off in whatever um, you are scraping off and consuming from this actual pan itself. And then cooking with seasonings to add or enhance flavor without any caloric or sodium sacrifice. So I love herbs and spices because they have no calories to them and they have no sodium to them. So you can really use them as liberally as you see fit and whatever satisfies your taste palate and your taste buds, you know, go full bore with any of those um, to enhance the flavor and enjoyment of the meals that you're actually cooking and consuming. Because you spend enough time preparing them, right? You might as well actually enjoy them once you actually start to put them in your mouth. <laughs> and I think, and that is all I have for that section. Do we have any other questions? Thank you so much. I did not see any questions in the Q&A or in the chat right now, but if you all have any questions, please feel free to submit those. Thank you so much. I have many takeaways from today's presentation. And again, this is something that I enjoy. Um, I will be using my cast iron pan more often. And I was again buying an air fryer, but that may be my next purchase. So we will see. Yes, that air fryer is so worth it. It has just been my favorite investment so far and it, it's really so versatile too. So um, I hope that everyone found some of the information presented here today to be useful and relevant. And like I said, I really do hope that you feel empowered and confident now going forward with your food choices and that hopefully that stigma has kind of been released from the way that you approach food now going forward. So yes, so that's we do have one to. person that just came in to ask a question. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute her because I have the capabilities of doing so. So Leanne, I'm going to unmute you if you want to ask your question. Yeah. Leanne. Yeah. Let's see if she's ready. While you're waiting for Leanne, I just wanted to chime in. Samantha, thank you so much. I, I found so many tips that I wouldn't have thought of you know, the, the iron skillet and just how you pair food for nutrients. A lot of great tips and it's really a state of mind and positive self attitude, which really kind of helps you to want to go on this journey and not think of it negatively. Like I have to lose weight. This is terrible. It, everything you said was very empowering. Thank you. Very, a really great thought provoking presentation. Well, thank you so much, Stacey, and that's exactly what I was hoping, so I'm really glad that that came across and that you found the information to be relevant and useful. So. Yeah, this is, uh, Blake, I can honestly say this is probably the best presentation in terms of this type of information I've, I've seen, and I, I've seen quite a few that make you kind of feel bad about your decisions and things, and, and you, I feel like you I've just spent an hour telling us that you shouldn't do that and, and it's okay not to do that and, and and i like how you approach the the topic so thank you for that and i got an air fryer over christmas and i'm dearly loving it from a guy that doesn't really cook but i have cooked more at home now with that thing it's a ninja six in one so do all kinds of fun things with it so yeah. but thank you i have, I have the five in one ninja. <laughs> ah, yes I, I went for that one but they only had the six so i ended up with that one. <laughs> Yeah, it is if you aren't that great at cooking either like it does do all the work for you so if you're brand new to cooking or you're learning how to cook it's a great just extra piece too absolutely so we have another question from lori so lori i'm going to go ahead and unmute you to ask your question oh i i just had a comment that um you can find a lot of recipes on pinterest for all the cool gadgets in your kitchen so especially like the air fryer or the cast iron skillet um, I'm not like a, a 
on Pinterest a lot, but I know that every time I go there, I just get lost. I'm like, oh my God, all this stuff looks so good. So it's a lot of different kinds of recipes on there. Yes, absolutely. And that's a great point too. Yeah, Pinterest is just, I love Pinterest because it's like a big electronic magazine. So great resource. Thank you, Lori. Uh, we did have another question from Elaine, how much attention should we pay to cholesterol in our food? So a little bit of this has to do with your genetics as well. So if you've gotten, I would first suggest getting some lab work done just to see like where your cholesterol levels are at, because some of us are predisposed genetically to have higher cholesterols to begin with, regardless of what we find in food. Um, so only animal products should have cholesterol on the food label to begin with. So let's just start there. So. In the past, there were like some peanut butter companies that had cholesterol listed. Any plant-based food should not have cholesterol. And if it does, that means that they've added like lard or beef tallow or something like that to the food. And it's really important, especially if you are like vegan or vegetarian, for example, to ask some of those questions like at a Mexican restaurant, if you're ordering um, bean dip and chips, ask the server how they prepare the refried beans because more often than not, they add lard into those beans. So someone goes in thinking like, oh, bean is plant-based and it's gonna be cholesterol free, not necessarily in, in that regard. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So when looking at them, um, the goal is usually less than like 300 milligrams per day, but that's really hard to check. So just looking and, do like a quick check on any of the foods. If it's less than like 10 milligrams in that serving, it's pretty neg negligible. If it's closer to like 50, just maybe moderate that portion or that serving size that you actually consume. Um, but also looking at other things. So not just the cholesterol in food, but also are you taking like um, a vitamin D supplement, for example, or consuming foods with more vitamin D in them? And I bring this up because my dad last year, he went in for blood work and his cholesterol was testing really high. And as I mentioned, you know, he has diabetes. So I really do kind of monitor and help him a lot with his nutrition. So I know exactly what he eats. He doesn't eat a lot of high fat foods. He uh, eats a lot of healthy fats. And so it didn't make any sense at all why his cholesterol was so high. So when I was over at my parents' house one day, we were talking about it and he was showing me his supplements. He pulled out, you know, a multivitamin. And then he didn't even mention it. He just pushed another bottle out of the way in the cabinet. He's like, oh, it's, and there's vitamin D up there that I take. I said, how much is that? So he pulled it down. When I added everything up that he was taking in his supplement regimen, he was consuming like 8,000 IUs of vitamin D a day. And vitamin D is a precursor to cholesterol. So if you do consume too much vitamin D, it can eventually convert it into cholesterol in your body. So for him, because his diet had nothing to do with his cholesterol intake, then I pulled him back on a lot of his supplements. I'm like, you need to reduce your vitamin D down. Because yes, the vitamin D is an issue in this country, but we don't need to be consuming that much. There are upper limits for a reason. So really just looking at like the whole picture, how much animal products are you really consuming in a day? And then what does your vitamin D status and your vitamin D intake look like? And that's a perfect segue into the question Leanne had is, uh, she was wondering about supplements and vitamins. So maybe okay. kind of what you recommend. So, just as a caveat, supplements are meant to do just that. They're meant to supplement your diet. So they should never, no one should really be taking them to try and replace any nutrient intake. So if you are low on vitamin D, for example, there just are not a lot of vitamin D rich foods. So that would be potentially a good one to consider incorporating into your regimen because it's really like um, salmon and walnuts are really like your best vitamin D rich foods. And then, you know, aside from going outside, but as dietitians, we don't really recommend supplements because we can never be fully sure of the safety and efficacy of them. So just doing your research and making sure that if you do choose to use supplements, getting them from a responsible manufacturer, you know, Nature Made does seem to be one of the best quality because they have that VSP seal. I would also make sure that you look for that. But again, first I would look at your overall diet. Are you able, are you capable of getting in, you know, all of your micronutrient needs with the food that you're consuming? Most often, most people do. And it's just, again, kind of getting the mentality, oh, for my health, I should do more. So more of something is not necessarily a good thing. So just look, is it really necessary for you to take that supplement um, to add to your regimen? Or are you getting in adequate amounts to begin with? 
The one exception I will say is like a protein supplement, just because when you are exercising, a liquid form of protein is just a little bit kinder to your system versus like a piece of steak right before you go to work out. So I, I will leave you, I will empower you to make those decisions for yourself as to if you want to uh, incorporate a supplement regimen into your day to day life. And what about something like a collagen or like a probiotic? So, okay, yeah, so those are becoming more and more popular. Collagen, I actually do think that the collagen has some weight to it. There is more research that needs to be done, but especially for anyone who is collagen deficient. So if you are someone who has started to lose hair early on in life, or you have thinner types of hair, then a collagen supplement might be something really useful to you to help improve your follicle quality. Um, but you can also get that again through food. So animal products, steak, bone broth, for example, you, you could get it through there. You don't necessarily need the collagen supplements. Like I know they're really popular uh, vital proteins, I think at um, like Target, for example. So you could do that. Or again, you could just do it the natural way with something like bone broth. Um, and then pre and probiotics. There's a lot of debate on those. Some gastroenterologists say that they're nonsense and that they don't work. Others truly believe in them. The one thing I will say that if you do choose to use them, make sure that you have both. So a lot of people ask like, should I have prebiotics or probiotics? You need both because the prebiotics are essentially breakfast for the probiotics. So I always use like the Pac-Man analogy. Your prebiotics are like the little white dots and your pros are Pac-Man coming in to eat the, the prebiotics. So just make sure you have that pairing. Perfect. Well, there are not any other questions, and I know we're over our time. I could probably talk about this all day, but I will spare everyone's time on this Friday afternoon. So thank you again um, from uh, the UNLV Alumni Association. And Stacey, if you have any last words or Blake. I just want to echo congratulations and thank you so much. Uh, everything that you talk about is so important. And I think with all of us coming through last year and mental health as well, you know, really thinking about taking better care of ourselves and it's a perfect segue and end to our wellness week. So thank you, Samantha, everyone on the call. Thank you for joining and let's be healthy and let's be positive and let's you and I'll be go fight win. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much to Stacey, Renee, and Blake for organizing this and inviting me to this. And thank you for everyone who logged in and attended today. Those were great questions that you asked, and I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. And like I said, congratulations for just taking care of yourselves. Thank you again. Thanks, Renee. Thanks, Blake. Thank you. Thanks, Samantha. Bye.